the Marines. We're looking for a few good Mega Marines. Welcome back to the 90s when everything was mega. Today we are doing a mega review of a Mega Marines vehicle that was mega pretty good. Hello everybody, Hoodie Coco here. This is the show where we review every vintage G.I. Joe toy from 1982 to 1994. In 1986, the sequel to the movie Alien was released. Aliens, directed by James Cameron, added some action elements, including the Colonial Marines. These bug hunters had futuristic gear and weapons and added some badassery to the franchise. G.I. Joe copied the Colonial Marines really twice, first with Battle Force 2000, in 1987. That really didn't take off. In my opinion, that should have been a separate toy line rather than shoehorned into G.I. Joe. The second time was with Mega Marines in 1993, and this time it was more blatant. It had Marines in the title, and the file cards even referred to bug hunts. In true 90s fashion, they had to cover everything in crazy neon colors. The Mega Marines introduced mutant monsters. Nothing says fully posable modern art army figure like less articulated, oversized mutant monsters. Yojo. The Mega Marines figures were also packaged with Play-Doh. Don't ask. There is one thing from Mega Marines that is generally loved by G.I. Joe fans from any era, and we're going to look at that today. HCC 788 presents the Monster Blaster. This is the G.I. Joe Mega Marines Monster Blaster APC Armored Personnel Carrier from 1993. This vehicle was available in 1993 only. It was discontinued for 1994. This is the only version of the Monster Blaster in the vintage era. It was re-released in different colors in 2004. The Monster Blaster was in the Mega Marines subset, and it was the only Mega Marines vehicle in the vintage line. The Mega Marines fought mutant monsters, which is why the name Monster Blaster makes sense. I always assumed the name was taken from Master Blaster from Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, but I haven't found any confirmation of that. Master Blaster runs by the town. There were four G.I. Joe Mega Marines, Blastoff, Clutch, Gung-Ho, and Mirage. There were four bad guys, Cyber Vipers, Mega Vipers, Bio Vipers, and Monstro Vipers. The Bio Vipers and Monstro Vipers were oversized mutant creatures, a first for the vintage G.I. Joe toy line. The Mega Marines were led by Gung-Ho, G.I. Joe's first Marine. His first figure was released in 1983, and uh, you can decide if the 80s colors or the 90s 90s colors are more outrageous. The uniforms, the name, and the general look of the Mega Marines seems to harken back to the Colonial Marines in the 1986 movie Aliens, but of course the Colonial Marines looked like actual soldiers with futuristic uniforms. Mega Marines had Crayola colors and Play-Doh armor. It may be claimed that Mega Marines are futuristic. I don't think so. Go as far in the future as you want and you will still find soldiers that do not want to be shot. Despite the name, Gung-Ho seems to be the only one who is actually a Marine. Clutch definitely is not. The other two guys seem to have been recruited directly to the Mega Marines and did not come from the United States Marine Corps. There's a variation of the Monster Blaster. Some releases of this vehicle had the green colors reversed with the dark green on top and the light green on bottom. I've also noticed on my example, all the neon green parts are more yellow, but this is not listed as a variation anywhere, so this may just be discoloration. My preference is for the variation with the lighter green on top. The one with the lighter green on the bottom has all the interior parts in that lighter green, and I just don't think the interior seats look right in a lighter green color than the exterior of the vehicle. What review of a G.I. Joe APC would be complete without a comparison to G.I. Joe's first APC from 1983? The 1983 APC is larger. They're close to the same width, but the APC is longer. The 1983 vehicle has a more realistic military design with a faux canvas camouflage top and, you know, no neon. If you pull the top off, you can see major differences on the inside. These two vehicles carry figures in entirely different ways. The 1983 APC has two long rows of seats for figures and foot pegs along the center aisle for even more figures. The Monster Blaster has a total of six 
seats in the troop carrying compartment. It does have some other seats on the vehicle, but then so does the APC. Where the Monster Blaster really wins is in armaments. It has guns all over it and one big main cannon. The APC has only one cannon on top. I have the instruction sheet and blueprints for the APC because I did open this vehicle and assemble it myself, and I made a video of it, so if you'd like to see this very Monster Blaster APC assembled, check out that video. I will say the blueprint segment is more limited than what we typically got in the 80s. I have the box for the Monster Blaster, so let's take a look at that. It has the G.I. Joe logo, the Mega Marines logo, there is some artwork of the Monster Blaster, and behind it is a green swirl. That green swirl was on other Mega Marines packaging. It was on the card for Mega Marines Gung Ho. I think the green swirl is maybe supposed to look like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Mutagen. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Tina Mutant Ninja Turners. Tina Turner. It's the perfectly contrived excuse to play this clip. Master Blaster runs by the town. On that box art, all four of the G.I. Joe Mega Marines figures are represented. Gung Ho is in front, and Clutch is manning a rear gun, but Clutch should be driving. Mega Marines Clutch's file card says he is supposed to be the Monster Blaster APC driver. Even though he is the driver of this vehicle, he was not included with the vehicle. He was a separate, single-carded figure. On the box art, we don't know who's driving, because this is the driver's seat, and we don't see anyone in there. Surprisingly, a couple bad guys are in the troop carrying compartment. They are prisoners, perhaps? On the bottom of the box and on the sides, that artwork is repeated along with the text. And on the top of the box, we see that artwork again, but we also have the flag points. This was worth four flag points. On the back of the box, we have a photograph of a prototype vehicle. It is not exactly the same as the production toy. There are some minor differences, there are some molding differences, and it is missing the pegs on the canopy for storing the extra missiles. The wheels appear to be screwed on and that is not on the production toy. Let's look at the parts and the features of the Monster Blaster and I'd like to start by making a couple observations. First, the vehicle is bilaterally asymmetrical. This was common on 90s vehicles. It can add some surprises and intricacies to the design, but it doesn't always work, as with Destro's Dominator. Sometimes the two halves of the vehicle seem totally disconnected and don't work well together at all. It works better better on the Monster Blaster though because it has this central cannon that kind of ties the whole design together. Since the Mega Marines was a colorful copy of Aliens Colonial Marines, my guess is the Monster Blaster was supposed to be like the APC in that movie, but with more features and details to make it a more fun toy. If 80s G.I. Joe fans have a complaint about this vehicle, it is with the neon green color. The rest of the vehicle has great color. It would fit in with any era of G.I. Joe. The neon green just screams 90s. There have been some customs of the Monster Blaster that have changed the neon to a more subdued color, and it's a thousand times better. On the front of the Monster Blaster, we have this bumper in dark green with a couple sticker headlights, and there are steps on each side so you can climb in the vehicle. On the variant, of course, this bumper would be the lighter green color we see on the top of the vehicle. On the starboard side, we have this gun that serves as a hatch for this seat. This gun is is articulated, it swings forward on this bar. It does not traverse, but it is nice to have some articulation here and nice to have some cover for the passenger in the seat. The blueprints call this a front mounted gunner's seat with targeting laser gun. The seat is dark green, it almost looks gray to my eyes. The seat is textured, and you may not be able to see it, but there is a texture on the floorboard as well. It has minimal instruments on the inside and it will fit one action figure. You can fit one action figure in the seat and you can move that gun over to completely cover him. He does fit in there completely. There are a couple control sticks on that front mounted gun but the figure cannot grasp them sitting down. He will have to stand up and those sticks are a little too big to fit in the figure's hands. You can fit the hands on them and he can kind of man the gun that way. I really like this. They could have just put a hatch over this seat or a front mounted gun but they did both. On the port side at the front there is this neon green hatch with 
with the Mega Marines logo. It is hinged at the front. You can open it by pushing forward at this tab, and that reveals the driver's seat. The seat is that same dark gray-green color as on the other side. It has the texture, and the floorboard also has texture. It has instruments on both sides, and on the right side it has a control stick. You can place the driver in the driver's seat. Of course it should be clutch. You have to put him in head first because his head will fit in this cavity. You can place the figure's hand on the control stick, but be careful with that. This time the problem is not that the control stick is too thick, but it is very thin and you might break the stick. With the driver in the seat, close the canopy. He fits fully inside with no problem, and there are slats on the canopy so he can see out and drive. There's also a viewing port on this faux hatch on the top of the body of the Monster Blaster, but the figure's head doesn't really go up that high. It's still a nice extra detail though. The main body of the Monster Blaster is in olive green and it looks really good. It has panels and molded on hatches and technical detail all over it. I think this is a good G.I. Joe vehicle. I think this would be considered a good G.I. Joe vehicle in any era. For a moment just block out the neon green coloring of the parts on this vehicle and just focus on that main body. The color is very close to the body of the mail away slugger and everybody likes this. If you were just looking at the body of the monster blaster and stopped there, I think every G.I. Joe fan from any era would like this vehicle. On each side there is a sticker with a number 7. Why the number 7? Well, the Mega Marines figures all had numbers. Gung-Ho had a 1 on his chest and Clutch had a number 3 on his leg. But if that's what they were going for, there are a couple numbers missing. There is no number 5 and 6. On each side there is a side rail in dark grayish green and on each side rail there are four foot pegs and that means you can put more figures on the outside. The foot pegs are far enough apart that you can put a figure on each peg so potentially eight more figures riding on these two side rails. On each side there are small steps that lead up to the troop carrying compartment. That is a really nice touch that easily could have been left off and it's nice that they are there. The Monster Blaster rolls along on four black wheels. These wheels are plastic. They are held together on mushroom clips at the hub. They each roll independently. If those wheels look familiar, it's because they are a reuse of the wheels used on the 1988 Mean Dog, with the Mean Dog wheels being dark gray and the Monster Blaster wheels being black. The Mean Dog wheels were also used on the 1991 Attack Cruiser, but this time in light gray. There is no detail on the underside, just the contouring for the interior seats. That brings us to the main feature on this vehicle and that is this canopy and the main cannon. This large central cannon is attached to the canopy. They are both in bright neon green. There is a hinge at the back of the cannon on the body of the vehicle so you can swing the cannon and the canopy up to open up the troop carrying compartment inside. There is a brace on the inside and notches on this central slot so you can adjust the height of the canopy. The interior is that same dark grayish green color as all of the interior parts are and on each side there is a front facing seat and two side facing seats. The seats are textured as is the floor and although the seats are mostly the same on each side the interior details and control panels are slightly different. It's very difficult to get the lighting down in there so you can see the interior detail but there is some technical detail and it is different on each side. As stated before there are three seats on each side, one on each side that faces to the front and two on each side that face to the outside. Uh, there are no back pegs or straps to hold the figures in but they do fit in there pretty securely. You can then lift this brace and close the canopy and the figures fit very well inside. Let's take a moment to admire the canopy and the cannon. There is a ton of technical gadgetry all over both of them. It is impressive, most impressive. But what's even more impressive is the cannon is functional. On top of the canopy, on either side of the cannon, there are four bright green missiles. They peg onto the canopy with these dumbbell-shaped pegs. They are the exact same color as the other parts on the vehicle. The blueprints call these monster-annihilating heat 
seeking M44 missiles. There is a total of four of them. They do peg on quite securely and they are all the same. And the cool thing about these missiles is you can really fire them. On the top of the cannon, there is an open slot. You can fit one of the missiles in that slot. The fins on the missile need to be on the top and the bottom and you place it in back first, but it should slide all the way inside. At the back of the cannon, there is a cocking handle. Move that forward and over to close the breech and move the trigger button into place. There's a circular opening on the top of the cannon and when the cannon is locked and loaded, there is a button that will appear in that opening. You will press that button to fire. Let's test it by taking aim at our old friend, Dr. Mindbender. I feel like I should reiterate what I've said before. I have no special hatred for this Dr. Mindbender figure. I fire missiles at him because one time when I was testing these spring-loaded missile launchers, this figure just happened to be within reach. Dr. Mindbender gets a lot of abuse. Maybe I should say something nice about him. Dr. Mindbender, you are a snappy dresser. But we are still going to fire a missile at him. To use this cannon, you just take aim and press this top button to fire. That was a good shot. Dr. Mindbender is still standing, though. Unfortunate for him, we still have three more shots. Load, close, aim, and fire. No, that one didn't work at all. Let's try for a third shot. There we go. Ready, and fire fire. My aim is getting worse. Dr. Mindbender may survive this time, but we got one more shot. Let's take aim and fire. There we go. Okay, so missiles aren't usually fired out of a cannon, but ignoring that fact for just a moment, the engineering on this is unbelievable. I know I'm an 80s guy, but this is as good as anything produced in the 80s. Even though I'm not a fan of the spring-loaded missile launchers, I have to admire what they've done here. They have a breech-loading, actually firing missile launcher. The closest 80s equivalent I can think of is the 1989 Thunderclap. It had a very large cannon with an open breech. You could place a shell in that breach and close it, then pretend to fire, then you could eject the shell. That was a really cool feature, but the Thunderclap cannon did not really fire, and the Monster Blaster did. We are not done looking at features. If you move toward the back, on each side you have laser gun mounts, and each of those laser guns will elevate and will pivot. They won't pivot all the way around because they'll run into the side of the vehicle, but this is more armament. The Monster Blaster is heavily armed. On the inside of each of those laser gun turrets, there is a slot for an action figure, so those guns can be manned, one on each side, and an additional two figures that can ride on the Monster Blaster. We are not done yet, but we are almost done. At the very back, there are a couple control panels, each with a couple control sticks. I don't know what they are controlling, but I guess you can pretend they're controlling anything. There's also a back platform with six foot pegs for a potential six more figures riding on this vehicle. I don't know if these foot pegs are thicker than the others, but my figures do not fit on them very well. The only thing missing is a universal tow hitch at the back, not that there was much to tow at the time, and there's so many other features I guess we can forgive that. Looking at how the Monster Blaster was used in G.I. Joe Media, it did not have any animated appearances. It was released after the animated series was already cancelled. It was featured in a TV commercial for Mega Marines, but it was not animated for that commercial. In the comic book series published by Marvel Comics, it appeared in issue number 173. It was not used by the Mega Marines. It was driven by Big Ben with Ninja Force riding in the back. It crashed and did not survive the issue. The comic gets the layout of the vehicle mixed up a bit and assumes the front gun position is the driver's seat. Storm Shadow takes over driving duties from Big Ben between panels. I assume that was an art error that they fixed with a bit of dialogue. It's surprising the Monster Blaster got any media appearances at all. It was getting late in the series and the Mega Marines didn't get much play anywhere. Looking at the Monster Blaster overall, it's a great vehicle with lots of cool features. I love it. The neon green is garish, but that can be fixed with a coat of paint. Do you remember in the 70s when everything was colored yellow, green, and brown? Or more accurately, mustard, avocado, and chocolate. Those colors were in fashion for some reason. A couple decades later, you look back at it and you say, my god, why is everything the color of pee, vomit, and poop? That's neon in the 90s. It was very hip at the time and now looks very dated. There is no denying the effort that went into the Monster Blaster. They skimped on nothing. Well, 
almost nothing. They reused the wheels from the Mean Dog, but other than that, a lot of effort went into this vehicle. The cannon is especially impressive. The loading and firing feature is one of the best in the entire series. Although I'm not a fan of the spring-loaded missile gimmick, I have to give credit where it's due. It's very satisfying to load and fire that cannon. The pegs for the missiles, another great bonus. The missiles will not be left to rattle around the inside of the vehicle. There is a place to put them. As an APC, it doesn't have quite as much space on the inside as the 1983 APC. It's about on par with the 1988 Warthog AIFV. The Monster Blaster could carry more figures, but most will have to ride on the outside. It's an armored personnel carrier, but most of the guys riding on it will not be protected by the armor. In conclusion, the Monster Blaster is really fun and well made, and if you haven't explored 90s G.I. Joe vehicles, this is a great place to start. That was my review of the Mega Marines Monster Blaster APC. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up on YouTube and subscribe to the YouTube channel for more vintage G.I. Joe toy reviews. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. The only way I can continue doing these videos is with the support of my friends on Patreon, and I greatly appreciate their support. If you would like to support the channel, that's a great way to do it. You see the name scrolling on the screen right now? Your name could be there. Next time, I think we should get back to the 80s, somewhere around 1984. I'll see you then, and until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. Master Blaster runs by the town.